Okay. Seeing no further introductions, therefore, it is time for question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Royal Opposition. Uh, Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Finance. The Ontario PC caucus called for, and we're happy to see the Liberals introduce some of our ideas in their housing plan. But, Mr. Speaker, the plan is missing a very important part, and it's failing to address the underlying problem. On Saturday in the Globe and Mail, economic expert Sean Spear put it best. The plan, I will quote, will do nothing to address the underlying supply issues affecting affordability. Let me repeat that. The plan will do nothing to address the supply issue. Mr. Speaker, why have the Liberals ignored the underlying issues for so long? To the Minister of Finance, Mr. Speaker, is there any, any goal for the government to address the supply issue? Thank you. Minister of Finance. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate the question from the man with no plan, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Here we have a party who is talking. Uh, stop the clock. I, I, I'm going to interject. Um, I'm going to hold to the tradition in the convention that we respect each other by naming each other's either their writing or their title. That's going to stay. Carry on. Well, the Leader of the Opposition has put forward no plan, Mr. Speaker, and instead he's going on about what it is that we should still do, a lot of talk, but no action. We have put forward a 16-point plan, plan that is actionable, that talks a lot about uh, addressing demand and addressing supply. It is why we have put measures in place to inspire and promote more supply into the mix. Vacancy, Mr. Speaker, and vacant lots are an issue. We're addressing that in this, uh, in this uh, plan, as well as discounting development charges and other things to try to promote more purpose-built into the, into the mix, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. It has been endorsed by yes, economists, sir. endorsed by the Bank of Canada, who recognizes how important it is to put these measures yeah. in place. The member opposite and his party have offered nothing, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, again to the Minister of Finance. The Minister of Finance is proud of his plan, taxes, 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 and more taxes, but the economic experts are saying it doesn't address the issue of supply. At a minimum, a detailed review of policies related to zoning and development should be part of the plan. I think we already know what that review would tell us. Too much red tape suffocating the system. Now, in the last 10 years in the GTA, we've seen the result of the Liberal red tape. At the end of January 2007, there were 18,400 new ground-oriented homes available for purchase for, for families in the GTA. In January of 2017, that number whip. had shrunk to 1,500. 18,000 to 1,500, wow. and they say there's no supply issue. Wow. So I will ask again, rather than attacking others and hurling insults, question. my question, Mr. Speaker, is will we deal with the supply issue that's causing spiraling housing prices? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, we're taking actions on the supply mix. We've actually pointed out a number of them, Mr. Speaker. They include surplus provincial lands. They have empowered some of the municipalities and the cities to provide for and expedite vacant properties. We're looking at reducing multi-residential apartment buildings, tax positions. We're investing $125 million in a five-year program to encourage construction of rental properties. We've taken a, a housing supply team that's being established, Mr. Speaker, dedicated to this very issues. And I have to say this, Mr. Speaker. Speaker. I have a quote here. It says this, looks like the government listens and, and are caring about people who are going to be exempt and we're diving from the tax who would contribute to our economy and help our health care system. That is from Tim Hudak, Mr. Oh! Speaker. He recognizes that we are doing what's necessary That's for it. the people of Ontario. Thank you. Final supplementary comedy hour over there. Mr. Speaker, again to uh, the Minister of Finance. And the Minister of Finance likes sharing quotes, and he just said that he believes there is a supply issue and they're acting on it. Well, the Premier, the Liberal Premier of Ontario, your boss, M Minister of Finance, on October 19th said the housing supply problem is a myth. So I'm glad at least the Minister of Finance recognizes and says that supply is an issue. Because you know what? All the independent experts are saying that it's a big issue. The Toronto Board of Trade said they question whether this Liberal scheme does anything to address the lack of supply to buy or rent in the face of unprecedented demand. I got a quote here from Jan De Silva of the Board of Trade. 
We've got 80,000 people moving into the city. We should have 30,000 new rental units a year coming on. Right now, there's very few. The average has been 1,500. So my question, Mr. Speaker, is we, this is not helping supply, but we know the government's going to collect a lot of new money. And so maybe the Minister of Finance can tell us what all these Thank new you. taxes is going to result in. How much money will the government get? But there's one thing. Thank you. Sorry. Minister of Finance. Oh, Mr. Speaker. Let's put it in perspective. What we're talking about is encouraging supply. The very taxes that he's talking about that we shouldn't do, again, no plan, is actually curbing and not encouraging supply. Yeah. The TD Economics says this, the tax on non-residents and paper flipping should together help stem speculative behavior, cool demand on properties in the Greater Golden Horseshoe. The National Bank of Canada says you could do nothing as is being proposed over here, or you could take action in the face of pronounced risk, implementing policies designed to both tame speculation, spur needed development, thereby placing the resulting housing market on a more stable footing. Ontario's finance minister has opted for the latter course of action, and it's a decision we applaud. Mr. Yeah. Speaker, that is Warren Lovely from the National Bank of Canada. Thank you. Your question? The Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Health. Since I can't get an answer from the Minister of Finance on supply, I'm going to hope that the Minister of Health will share us with an answer on a very important topic. According to the Ontario Drug Policy Review, Review Research Network, this province has more than two people who die each day from an opioid overdose. That's unacceptable. Mr. Speaker, how many more days are we going to have to bear this tragic statistic in the province of Ontario. Can the Minister of Health please tell us how he's going to deal with this crisis? Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, uh we are taking action on this side of the legislature, Mr. Speaker. In fact, last fall, we introduced the first opioid strategy in this province's history. In fact, we are at the, front, the leading edge, if not in front of the rest of the country when it comes to the measures that we've put in place to tackle the opioid crisis, which, as we all know, is a national crisis, including here in the province. We're investing more in our pain clinics, 17 pain clinics. We're investing more in treatment centres for those that face addictions. We're making naloxone available but we have made it for almost one year available free of charge through pharmacies. More than 1,000 pharmacies in the province are providing this, and they've distributed more than 28,000 life-saving naloxone kits uh, that can literally save a life uh, at that moment of need, Mr. Speaker. We're working on improving prescribing with our frontline health care professionals. There's a whole set of measures, and I hope the member opposite understands this can't be a partisan issue. This needs to be an issue where we all work together to end this, this epidemic, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, again to the Minister of Health, you know, last week in Ottawa, 15 overdoses in 72 hours. Obviously, this is a crisis. Obviously, we're not doing enough. Too often, opioid pills are cheap and easy to get, and they're dangerous. A lethal dose of pure fentanyl is as little as two milligrams, the weight of seven poppy seeds. People don't realize, young people don't realize how dangerous this can be. The Premier and the Minister must crack down on this scourge that is hurting our youth, that is hurting families, that is hurting people in Ontario. And so my question, Mr. Speaker, to the Minister of Health is, will he support the official opposition's call to cancel the hydro vanity ads and use the limited advertising budget the province has to raise public awareness on this issue? Young people are dying, and there is not a proper appreciation for how dangerous this fentanyl is. Question. Thank you. Please. You seen it, please? Thank you. Minister? Well, Mr. Speaker, if the member opposite thinks it's as simple as simply launching a public awareness campaign, he's dead wrong, Mr. Speaker. There's so many measures that are required to address this, and it includes the investments that we're making this year in more treatment centres for youth in Ottawa. It includes the fact that more than 80 pharmacies in Ottawa are providing free of charge, life saving naloxone available over the counter with training from the pharmacists that can save lives. I'm as concerned as the member opposite about the availability of illicit fentanyl, carfentanyl, and other narcotics uh, on our streets. We all need to work together to end this scourge. It's something which we've been doing for many years. We have a strategy to address it. I'd like to know, other than fancy ads to increase awareness, what's in his plan, Mr. Speaker? Thank you. Final supplementary. If you pay attention on Friday, you would have heard our plan. 
Mr. Speaker, again to the Minister of Health. It, there is multiple ways to tackle this crisis, and, and Mr. Speaker, the fact is. I'm, uh, Finish, please. Mr. Speaker, you know, on such a serious issue, they, they, they attack rather than want to work together. You know, the, 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 the member for Nipissing had a great idea on fentanyl patches. The, minister, the MPP for Kitchener and Conestoga had a great idea on the legal pill press machines, but they attack. They, they, they don't understand that there are many ways we can attack this issue, and one of the ways is to stop spending the government's advertising budget on vanity ads supporting the Liberal Party rather than actually raising awareness for young people. This is not a partisan issue, so I'm asking again, will the Minister of Health support our request to use the limited advertising budget Question. to actually make young people aware how dangerous this is? You know, when I was in Ottawa, I heard about 14-year-old Chloe Cotville, 19-year-old Tesla Thank Russell, you. who died because— Thank you. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. The uh, member from Davenport come to order. Minister of Health. Mr. Speaker, since April 1st of this year, every hospital in this province is reporting, at least on a weekly basis, overdoses that they see in their ERs. We've named the first ever provincial overdose coordinator, Mr. Speaker. We have, we're working with the coroner to expedite the, and improve the data that's available for important decision making. We're doing everything we can imagine. In fact, Mr. Speaker, the pill press idea, which is a good idea that the federal government is working on because that's a federal issue. I'd like to hear more ideas because in the 10 years when he was member of a government in Ottawa, I can tell you what he did on the, on the opioid crisis that we've known for a decade, Mr. Speaker. He did nothing. You see it, please? You see it, please? Order. New question. The leader of the third party. Speaker, my question is to the acting premier. There are 2.2 million people in Ontario who don't have drug coverage, and I don't think those those people should have to empty their wallet just to get the kind of medications that they need. Or worse go without the medications that they need. Does the Liberal government think the same, Speaker? Thank you. Deputy Premier. Long-term care. Minister of Health, long-term care. Mr. Speaker, I applaud the member from the third party uh, for her advocacy on this important issue. And, <laughs> and, but Mr. from Speaker, Timmins, Mr. James Speaker, Bain. The member in the party, the third party, know that for at least the past three years, our government Myself, the Premier, have been strong and relentless advocates in advocating for a national pharmacare program. In fact, I would argue that we have been the largest and the strongest political voice nationally on this issue for the last few years. Mr. Speaker, it's important that all of us in this legislature and outside who believe in the importance of a national pharmacare program in access to medicines. As a health care professional myself, I understand just yes, how critically important that is. It's important we all work together to hopefully meet that vision, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, part of the problem is that there's lots of talk, but there's no action. Today in Ontario, Today in Ontario, there will be people who go to a doctor or a nurse practitioner and they'll get a prescription and they'll leave that appointment knowing 
that they can't afford to fill that prescription. That means they won't take the medication that they need, Speaker. I don't think that that's right. Does the Liberal government? Minister. Mr. Speaker, uh, we, uh, there's no distance between uh, myself and the leader of the third party on this issue. We both agree, agree on how critically important it is that the estimated one out of ten, perhaps more families across this country that uh, are unable to access medicines because of the socio their socioeconomic status. We agree on this, and even more so, Mr. Speaker, as a, as a practicing physician, uh, particularly practicing since graduation with lower socioeconomic groups, refugees and immigrants, primarily from Africa. I know just how vitally real, how absolutely real this challenge is and how important it is that this unfinished business of Medicare that was envisioned 51 years ago, Mr. Speaker, that we all work together to, thanks to Tommy Douglas. There's no question, thanks to Tommy Douglas. It's unfinished business, and I have been challenging this. I have been Thank championing you. this issue for three years, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Final supplementary. In fact, there's a big distance, Speaker, because we would actually implement universal care in the province of Ontario, not just talk about it, Speaker. Not just talk about it. Today, in cities and towns all across our province, there are people who will get prescription sorry who will get a prescription filled and and in fact when those people <laughs> get home they'll sit down at their kitchen table and they'll take their pills from that prescription bottle and they will split each and every one of those pills in half because the medication is so expensive in fact one in four ontarians right now are forced to do exactly that speaker i think people should be able to take the medication they need at the dosage that their physician has pres prescribed question does the liberal government Minister. Of, of course we do mr speaker of course we believe that act, that issue of health equity and access is vitally important that's why in 2014 i met with the federal minister of health then rona ambrose and our provincial and territorial health ministers and i advocated for national pharmacy pharmacare in 2015 i hosted a conference here in toronto on national pharmacare mr speaker in 2015 i advocated again at the federal provincial and territorial level in 2016 when we hosted that same group of federal, and provincial, and territorial ministers. I called for it again. The me member op Finish, please. The member opposite knows how important this issue is. I just wish she had of been there three years ago, two years ago, one year ago, Answer. side by side with me, advocating for this important vision. New question. The leader of the third party. Next question is for the acting premier, Speaker. But I can tell the Minister of Health that we were there telling them to back off increasing seniors' prescriptions. That's the only thing they did: is increase the cost of prescriptions for seniors. Look, Tommy Douglas absolutely was the founder of Canadian health care uh, in, in our country, and we all know that. And He famously said, and I quote, let's not forget that the ultimate goal of Medicare must be to keep people well, not just keep patching them up when they get sick. Keeping people well means ensuring that they have the medicine speaker that they need to stay healthy. It means universal pharmacare for everyone. It means lower costs for families less worry for working people, and better health care for Ontarians. Does the Liberal government believe that our health care system should be keeping people healthy Question. or just patching people up until the next time? Mr. Speaker, I'm proud of the fact that our drug benefit system in this province is one of the strongest, most generous in the entire country, if not the most generous, Mr. Right. Speaker. Right. And I'm proud that in last year's budget, we announced that an additional 170,000 seniors would no longer have to pay an annual deductible, Mr. Speaker, and their co-payment yeah. was reduced from $6 <laughs> down to $2. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, we need to all of us be proud of the efforts that we've made over the 
the past decade to expand the availability of drugs. Just recently, after introducing a virtual cure for hepatitis C, we've announced the expansion of that program uh, at a cost of hundreds of millions of dollars to the Treasury, Mr. Speaker. But we're doing that because we know just how critically important it is to provide these life-saving medications. Yeah. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. As I recall, it was the Canadian Association of Retired Persons. It was seniors across the province. It was New Democrats that forced them to back down from increasing prescription costs for seniors. That's what was in their initial budget, Speaker. I think the minister forgets. Look, Canada needs a universal pharmacare program. I'm glad that the minister agrees and talks a lot about it. But just because the federal government is dragging its feet, it doesn't mean that the people of Ontario should have to empty their wallets for the medications that they need, Speaker, or worse, go without them. Does the Liberal government understand that the people of this province need universal pharmacare? Thank you. Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, we did hear from our stakeholders with regards to our efforts to expand the availability and reduce the cost of drugs. We introduced that in our budget. It led to 170,000 more seniors paying no annual deductible and reducing their co-payment. Co and, Mr. Speaker, the third party voted against that measure. They know they did. But, Mr. Speaker, pharmacare is too important to make it a, par a partisan issue. And I'm proud of the fact that our Premier and myself for many years now have been advocating across this country. We have been the strongest political leadership advocating for pharmacare. Uh, I do not recall having these conversations with the party, the third party, from two Hamilton years East, Stony ago, Creek. or two years ago, even week. one year ago, Answer. but I'm glad that they've finally come to the table, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. Thank you. Final supplement. Thank you, Speaker. And we'll proudly vote against budgets that starve hospitals and cut autism services off for kids over five. Speaker, more than 2.2 million Ontarians don't have any drug coverage whatsoever. And the problem is getting worse, not better, Speaker. As work becomes less stable and less secure, it's harder for people to find jobs with benefits. I believe that parents shouldn't have to empty their wallet or reach for a maxed-out credit card when their daughter or son is having an asthma attack and they need to go to the pharmacy to get an inhaler. Working people shouldn't have to skip their heart medication because they're lost, they lost their jobs or their, their benefits got cut off. Ontario should be a leader. This province should be a leader. Will universal Question. Medicare be, or sorry, will universal Pharmacare be in next in this week's budget speaker on Thursday, or will the people of this province be left waiting and suffering yet again by this Liberal government's lack of action? <laughs> Mr. Speaker, universal access to drugs is a gap nationally in our medical care system, and it needs to be addressed. And that's why in 2015, Minister. That's why in 2015 I convened a roundtable of some of the leading experts nationally and internationally to get their Finish. And then in January 2016, I discussed the issue again at the FPT level, level leading to the creation of a working group, a pan-national working group, to look specifically at the issue of Pharmacare. The member opposite knows that this is not a simple issue. I raised it again last fall at the FPT, and our advocacy continues unrelenting, Mr. Speaker. Yep. New question, the member from Nipissing. And good morning, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Finance. Last week, I wrote to you uh, specifically about Northern Ontario with four budget recommendations. End your hydro crisis, make cap-and-trade revenue neutral, save our rural schools, 
and take action on the growing debt. Interest payments on that debt are crowding out the services people in Northern Ontario depend on. You've cut staff at the hospitals in Atacokan, Espanola, Lake of the Woods, Temiskaming, Sudbury, the Sioux, Timmins, Thunder Bay, and more. The almost 400 frontline health care workers you've cut in North Bay, including 100 nurses, is having a severe impact on patients' health care. Will you commit to immediately paying down the province's debt, lay out a long-term debt plan, and stop trying to balance your Question. budget on the backs of patients in northern hospitals? Thank you. Minister Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I do appreciate the question from the member opposite. Um, he, he's just gone on about how we should not borrow, not invest in hospitals and in schools because he wants to do across-the-board cuts. That's been their recommendation. And, Mr. Speaker, on this side of the House, we don't ascribe to that. We've taken a very balanced approach. We've done a very thoughtful approach to invest, to stimulate growth, to invest in those programs and services that Ontarians care for and rely upon, Mr. Speaker. They opted for 100,000 job cuts in their, last, in their last election, Mr. Speaker. We didn't do that. We're balancing the books. We're investing in the things that matter to the people of Ontario, and I'll have more to say about that on April 27th, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary, the member from Niagara West Carnival. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Finance. I also wrote to the Minister last week. Nurses and doctors in Niagara tell me the same sad story. Frontline health care in the Niagara region is a major concern, but this government has cut over 1,500 nursing positions over the past year. In some cases, there is only one registered nurse taking care of over 200 seniors in a long-term care facility. This is unfair to our nurses, unfair to our seniors, and unfair to the people of Niagara. While blaming this situation on funding restrictions, this government keeps wasting money on layers of bureaucracy and duplication of services which only feed frustration. My question is to the minister. Will this government stop wasting the taxpayers' hard-earned dollar on the growth of senseless bureaucracy, and will this budget invest in the frontline health services that actually serve the people Thank of Ontario? So, Mr. Speaker, I'm very proud of the work and the increases that we have put in budgets for health care, for frontline services. We have more nurses than we did before, Mr. Speaker, and I remind the member opposite who's new to this House, they actually wanted to cut 100,000 people on the front lines. We will continue to invest in our hospitals. We'll continue to invest in our education. We'll continue to build more schools and more hospitals. We're going to continue hiring more doctors and more nurses, as we have year over year, Mr. Speaker. The people of Ontario rely on those services. We opted to invest in those services, not make the cuts that they've been advocating for, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Your question, the member from Toronto, Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question to the Acting Premier. Hydro bills at the Sioux Area Hospital have jumped nearly a million dollars in recent years. It's become clear that the hospital, along with manufacturers and other medium-sized businesses, will not see any bill reductions despite the Premier's promises. And late last Friday, the Ontario Energy Board revealed that no one will see the full reductions that the Premier promised would be in place this summer. The summer hydro rates that were just posted by the Ontario Energy Board do not include all the reductions promised by the Premier. Why do the Premier's hydro promises keep falling short? Thank you. Thank you, Premier. To the Minister of Energy. Of Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Very pleased to rise and talk about the 25 percent reduction that everyone will see come this summer, Mr. Speaker. The OEB rate uh, that was announced last week is an additional 9 percent, Mr. Speaker, so everyone on May 1st will see a 17 percent reduction when you take the 8 percent that started in January plus the 9 percent that's coming, Mr. Speaker. That's 17 with more to come, Mr. Speaker, and that's great news for, um, for all families right across the province, and I know, Mr. Speaker, that 
but it's very hard to understand that when it comes from a party that has no plan, no real substance, Mr. Speaker, when it comes to reducing rates. They've got pie-in-the-sky ideas, Mr. Speaker. They want to form a committee and maybe have that committee in some day come up with a solution. Our solution is working, Mr. Speaker, so much so that the OEB already brought forward a 9 percent reduction on top of the 8 percent. We're going to see 25 percent reduction by summer, Mr. Speaker. That's good for all families, for farms, yes, and for 500 small businesses right across our province, Mr. Thank Speaker. Supplementary. Speaker, back to the Acting Premier. Starting May 1st, hydro disconnections will resume. Thousands of Ontario families will lose their power because they can't afford their soaring hydro bills. The Premier, the Premier could bring Hydro One back into public hands so that ratepayers don't have to pay the 20 per cent increase that Hydro One's private investors are demanding. The Premier could re renegotiate her overpriced privatized power contracts. Instead, she's spending up to $40 billion to get herself out of a political jam while doing nothing, nothing to rein in the underlying costs of hydro. Why won't the Premier put families and businesses first in Ontario instead of the political needs of the Liberal Party? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's families, small businesses, and farms, Mr. Speaker, that have been put first in this, Mr. Speaker. By giving them an average of 25% reduction come summer, Mr. Speaker, that's putting them first, Mr. Speaker. Low-income individuals, we've increased the OESP program, Mr. Speaker, by 50%, including more families and more individuals that qualify, Mr. Speaker, putting them first. You know where they were, Mr. Speaker, in their plan? The last page. I'm not even mentioning First Nations, Mr. Speaker. We are making sure we're helping First Nations. We're helping small businesses. We're helping farms, Mr. Speaker. When it comes to putting families first, when it comes to putting small businesses first and farms first, Mr. Speaker, that is something that we do, Mr. Speaker. On the other side of the House, they put them on the last page and forget about them, Mr. Answer. Speaker. We have no time to look at pie in the sky ideas like they do. That's why we're acting by summer with 25 per cent. Well, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Finance. Speaker, a couple of weeks ago, the Minister, in a speech to the Empire Club, confirmed that Ontario was one of the fastest growing provinces in Canada and that our economy continues to outpace Canada and all other G7 nations. We have created almost 700,000 new jobs since the recession, and unemployment is at a 10 year low. Speaker, these numbers are important. They show that we are on the right track. They show that we are prudent fiscal managers of Ontario's economy. Our government has taken a responsible approach to eliminating the deficit while continuing to invest in key public services. In my own riding of Beaches East York, we are continuing to invest in critical new investments that will strengthen our community and other parts of Ontario. So, Speaker, could the minister provide an update on our fiscal plan in advance of the 2017-218 budget? Thank you, Minister Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I'd like to thank the member from Beaches East York for the question. I am happy to formally announce that this Thursday, April 27th, I will deliver the 2017-18 Ontario budget. And, Mr. Speaker, it will be a balanced budget. When the global recession hit, we made a choice to invest in our economy while protecting the vital public services like health care and education. Ontario met this challenge head on. We made the decision to put Ontario first. Our government set a realistic and responsible approach to return to balance by 2017-18, and this week our government will deliver on that commitment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, thank you, Speaker. That is incredibly great news, and I want to thank the Minister of Finance for his continuing excellent stewardship of our province's economy. And I know I speak for everyone when I say that we are anxiously awaiting the budget this Thursday, because we know that a balanced budget means that the government will no longer need to borrow to pay for its job ongoing operating costs. It means that an important commitment that we made in the 2014 election is being delivered on. It means a promise made has been a promise kept. And we know that a strong economy together with a balanced budget is positioning Ontario for our long-term fiscal sustainability. And in my own riding of Beaches East York, we are already seeing the benefits of our government's increased fiscal flexibility. So, Speaker, would the minister then explain exactly what he means 
by a Mr. balanced budget, what it will mean for the province of Ontario, and particularly, Speaker, what it will mean for my constituents in Thank Beaches, you. East York. Minister of Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, it's simple. The member from Beaches, East York, noted a balanced budget means more money to invest in health care, education, and the things that matter most to the people of Ontario. We're no longer working to eliminate the deficit, but our principle remains the same. Build Ontario up in a balanced way to protect our economy, to promote jobs and security. Because of our balanced budget, there will be new investments in public education, in child care, in transit, and in business support. Because of our balanced approach, there will be more investments in health care as well. The people of Ontario have worked hard to achieve a balanced budget and build a stronger Ontario. We're working with the people of Ontario, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The question the member from Kitchener, Carl Stolten. Uh, my question is to the Minister of Finance. Speaker, over a decade of Liberal budgets have meant Waterloo Region residents are working harder but getting less as provincial debt interest yep. crowds out services and promised infrastructure improvements we all depend on. Patients in Waterloo Region are waiting longer for vital procedures. All day, two way go is now not the promised five, but another 10 years away, and promised high speed rail has hit a speed bump. From what I heard around the region last week, Liberal caucus members aren't the only ones airing frustrations about lacking Liberal oh, leadership. Oh, oh. Speaker, I wrote the oh, Minister of Finance to tell him that we can't afford to be left behind by yet another Liberal budget. Knives are out. Will the Minister commit today to immediately pay down the province's debt in his upcoming budget, to move forward on service and infrastructure investments we require, or will he Question. continue down a budget path that leaves us stuck in reverse? Here, here. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, let's be clear what the member is asking, what the member and the leader of the opposition is asking, and what all of them are, are alluding to. They're asking us to invest more in education, invest more in public transit, invest more in hospitals. But they're asking us to actually do the opposite. They want us to cut our borings, all of which is going to do exactly what's going to make us competitive long term. Mr. Speaker, our debt to our GDP is strong and it's improving over time. It actually outpaces. We are leading Canada, we're leading the United States, we're leading the G7 in our economic growth because of the investments that we're making. The member opposite is asking us to actually make cuts to the very things that he's wanting us to invest in, Mr. Speaker. To supplementary. From Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Finance also. Last week, I wrote to the Minister calling on him to address the real concerns of Ontarians in his budget and not his government's self-serving political priorities. In my area, the cost of servicing the province's massive debt is hurting hardworking people. We've seen reduced access to health care, including overcrowded hospitals and wait lists for long-term care that have grown to 4,500. Wow. Our communities have been hit by unwanted school closures like that of Lakefield Secondary wow. School. Businesses like Cedar Villa Holsteins have seen their hydro bills triple due to the ongoing hydro crisis. The government's 2017 budget needs to address these failures in management that are making life harder for families in Halliburton, Quarth Lakes, Brock and Peterborough. Can we expect the government to stop focusing on their own political pet projects and address the real concerns of Ontarians? Here, here. Minister. Mr. Speaker. It astounds me that the member opposite is asking a question about investing in health care in her community when we did. We increased it by 10 percent, Mr. Speaker, in her very community. It astounds me that the member opposite belongs to a party where their interest on debt represented 15 percent of their revenues, of their budget. Today, it's 8.9 percent, Mr. Speaker. We've locked in rates for 30 and 40 years so that we can minimize the volatility of interest rates and invest in the very things that they're asking for. Mr. Speaker, they're sucking and blowing on this one. I would. Uh, it's not helpful either. I would ask the member to temper his uh, comments. I would like you to. I, uh, I, I would ask. I would ask all members to kind of uh, relax a little bit. New question: The member from London West. 
Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Acting Premier. Last week, London Health Sciences Centre Mental Health ER was at 146 per cent capacity, with 18 patients waiting for beds. This was not an isolated spike. As this Liberal government knows, this has been the reality in London for years. Yet the Ministry continues to sit on a pilot project proposal that was, sub that was submitted by my community last fall to allow ambulance transfer of non-acute mental health and addiction patients directly to their crisis centre instead of the hospital emergency room. I understand there was a meeting last week with ministry staff at which several options were discussed. What was not discussed was the pilot proposal itself. What my community wants to know is, is this pilot project on or off the table as a solution to the mental health crisis in London? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Mr. Of Health, Long Term Care. Well, Mr. Speaker, we, we love the pilot project. We just want to support it without breaking the law. Yeah. And so, Mr. Speaker, so earlier this year, we put together a proposal uh, that was rejected by uh, the local community that if the centre came under the corporate structure of the hospital, we would be able to implement that pilot project immediately, Mr. Speaker. I know that uh, later this week, the member opposite. Uh, will be briefed by my ministry uh, on all options uh, within uh, existing uh, legislative opportunities uh, on how we might proceed with what we all agree is an important project that needs to be further supported. Uh, and I'd remind the member opposite that it was this government uh, two years ago, I believe, that invested $1.2 million to create Answer. the crisis centre that she is talking about in the first place. We're committed to it. We've demonstrated our commitment, and we're continuing to work Thank with you. that centre in the Lynn. Supplementary. Again to the Acting Premier, as the capacity crisis at the hospital keeps getting worse, patients are suffering more, offload delays are getting longer, and the costs associated with ambulances having to wait at the hospital are increasing. The pilot project could divert as many as 3,000 people a year from the hospital ER, generating savings of two. $2.5 million. Instead of waiting six hours or more to be seen at the hospital, a patient could access care at the crisis centre in as little as 20 minutes. Speaker, this pilot project could be in place within a month, providing an immediate solution to ease some of the pressure on the hospital ER. Will this Liberal government commit to doing whatever is necessary to allow the pilot project to proceed? Good question. Well, Mr. S Mr. Speaker, we, we, there's, you know, there's no argument in terms of the value of what is being proposed. However, the regulatory fix that the member opposite has promulgated just doesn't work within the confines of the existing legislation. And were we to take a legislative approach, it could take many months for that process to reach its conclusion. However, at, I asked the ministry to brief me on this issue last week. They did. I then asked them with the several suggestions for uh, promoting it that had come forward for them to brief the proponents in the field, Mr. Speaker, together with the Lynn. They're doing that this week. The member opposite is, bring, is being briefed tomorrow, Mr. Speaker, and I'm confident that if we work in a participatory way without thinking that there's some quick fix to this, particularly given the absence of workable ideas yes, that she's brought forward, I'm confident that we can actually support this. Yeah. New question, the member from Trinity Spadina. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, my question is to the Minister for Research, Innovation and Science. All over the globe, developed economies are starting to embrace new technologies that will transform many of our most important business sectors. A number of these new technologies are remarkable sectors that have the potential for incredible growth. One area that comes to mind is artificial intelligence, a powerful resource that Ontario is a competitive leader in. Yes, we are. If artificial intelligence can be managed properly, it has incredible potential to keep Ontario firms globally competitive. Speaker, can the minister tell the member of this house about how he is ensuring business in Ontario will stay ahead in the innovative economy in regards to AI? Great question. Thank you, Minister of Research, Research and Science. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member from Trinity Spadina for that very good question. Mr. Speaker, the member is absolutely right. 
Artificial intelligence is quickly becoming a business sector capable of massive expansion. It is my honor to inform Mr. Speaker the House of the recent announcement on, on the creation of the Vector Institute, supported by an investment of $50 million from our government, backed by the federal government, and with over 25 private sector investors, we are certain this institute is the first step towards entrenching Ontario as a leader in artificial intelligence. Right. Mr. Speaker, the Vector Institute will collaborate with industry partners from sectors such as healthcare, banking, accounting, insurance, retail, and telecommunications. Mr. Speaker, the opportunities are limitless. They are limitless. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. And uh, I want to thank the minister for his response. It's great to hear that our government is investing the tools and resources Ontario firms need to remain globally competitive. Yes, it it's more important than ever that this government takes these steps to stay ahead when it comes to research and development of experimental technologies. Investments like this will help diversify our economy and create jobs of future that will, in, that, that will be in incre increasing demand. Could the minister please speak to uh, speak a little more about this exciting initiative and how his ministry expect Vector Institute to uh, to improve AI in Ontario? Thank you, Minister. Mr. Speaker, again, I want to thank the member from Sp uh, Trinity Spadina for that question. Mr. Speaker, staying ahead of the competition in the world of great economic change requires us to work harder and to work smarter. Artificial intelligence can help us do that. The Vector Institute will help coordinate Ontario's existing artificial intelligence resources, direct investment for research and development, and create highly skilled jobs. An institute of this caliber, Mr. Speaker, will attract top artificial intelligence researchers from all over the world, as well as keep homegrown Ontario talent right here in the province of Ontario. Mr. Speaker, through the Vector Institute, we will be able to provide Ontario businesses with Made in Ontario AI tools and to promote the exportation of Ontario technology worldwide. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Your question, the member from Elgin, Middlesex, London. Mr. Speaker, Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Finance. I too wrote the Minister last week. Speaker, people across London and southwestern Ontario are struggling. They're working harder, paying more, but falling further behind. The province's debt continues to cause staffing and service cuts to London Health Science Centre and St. Joseph's Hospital. The hydro crisis has caused businesses like North Star Ice to see their hydro bills increase by 50 per cent in two years. And after 14 years of scandal, waste and mismanagement, we've created a fast-tracking of school closures, which is gutting rural Ontario and the Thames Valley District School Board region. Mr. Speaker, we need a firm commitment from this Liberal government not pre-election propaganda such as the high-speed rail project promised in 2014, which they have since backtracked. Mr. Speaker, will the Minister of Finance commit to the people of London and southwestern Ontario and include their needs that I've outlined in this year's budget? Mr. Budget. Mr. Budget. Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Stop. This budget, this budget, will speak to the needs of London, Ontario. It'll speak to the needs of the people in Windsor, from Windsor all the way to Kenora, all the way to Cornwall, all the way to Capuscasing, Thunder Bay, North Bay, Mr. Speaker, everywhere in between. It's about investing in the people of Ontario. It's about investing in hospitals, investing in education, investing in schools, Mr. Speaker. Not about cutting as being proposed by the member opposite in the past. This is about invest to stimulate growth. We have over 700,000 net new jobs in the depth of the recession, Mr. Speaker. That's not by accident. That's because we invested and we believe in Ontario and we'll continue to support them. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My, my question is to the Minister of Finance. I've also written to the Minister as well. Massive cap and trade costs are causing havoc on the greenhouse industry that is so vital to my riding of Chatham Ken Essex. Jared Mastronardi, owner of TG and G Mastronardi Greenhouses, has said that his family business will be lucky to survive after their natural gas bills were doubled by the Wynn government. Matt Marchand, president of the Windsor Essex Regional Chamber of Commerce, noted that the result of, his, of this scheme is that we're going to export jobs into other jurisdictions like That's Ohio right. all going to the states. and import their pollution. 
Minister, your government's cap and trade scheme is ludicrous. And to prove this, Carl Mastronardi of Sunrite Greenhouses said that he would have paid less in government fees had he not installed $2 million worth of energy saving curtains in his greenhouses. Now it's his company could have qualified for savings that are available to larger natural gas users. He said there's no incentive to save Question. energy. The only green this government is concerned about is money, not the environment. So, Speaker, will the Liberals stop the cash and grab and make cap and trade revenue neutral? Here, here. Thank you. <laughs> Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, despite the challenges that we've had in, in our economy as we've gone out and recovered from the recession, um, we've invested. And the agri-food industry, the agri-food processing, we are proud in this country right. for the tremendous amount of GDP that agriculture brings to Ontario. We invested $19 million just in the greenhouse industry, Mr. Speaker, and we know we know that foreign direct investment, we lead in that in this province, among all other jurisdictions. And it's not by accident again, it's because of our encouragement for that economic activity. We'll continue to support, we'll continue to invest. And Mr. Speaker, the member opposite makes reference to the fact that jobs are important. They're critically important. That's why we have to embrace the new economy. He's turning his back on that new economy. He doesn't That's want right. to go to clean tech. He wants to actually turn around and put his head in the sand. As the rest of the world leads, Ontario will always lead, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Speaker. Order. New question, the leader of the third party. Speaker, my question is for the acting premier. Jamie Lee Ball is a young woman who found herself in excruciating pain. She was suffering from internal bleeding and complications from surgery. So she went to the emergency room at Brampton Civic Hospital to get some help. But instead of getting a hospital bed, Jamie Lee was put on a stretcher in a hallway. She was labeled hallway patient number one. And she spent five long days and nights waiting for a real hospital bed. Why does this Liberal government think that hallway medicine is good enough for Jamie Lee and other patients in Brampton? Minister of Health, long-term care. Well, Mr. Speaker, I appreciate the uh, leader of the third party raising this. Uh, it had been raised uh, earlier in the legislature as well, and at that time I was uh, able to express my uh, deep concern, certainly my sympathy and empathy for uh, this uh, individual uh, young woman. And, uh, Mr. Speaker, it's not acceptable that a, an individual should have to spend that length of time under those conditions. I know that the hospital uh, also is extremely concerned about it, working uh, on the issue, uh, working with the family as well. Uh, it's important that uh, we find ways as we increase our investments to hospital, including significant increases uh, over the last year to uh, the Brampton Civic and the associated hospitals in the order of $25 million new funds last year, that we find those solutions so that unfortunate, uh, Answer. unacceptable situations like this do not happen in the future. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, they don't want sympathy. They want change, Speaker. That's what they want. This government has starved hospitals for years in this province. That's why we're in such of a crisis. Look, Ontario's hospitals have been pushed to the breaking point by this minister and by this government. Hospitals are seriously overcrowded. Surgeries are being cancelled. Patients like Jamie Lee and Brampton are being forced to spend days in a situation of complete indignity in hospitals, hallways, on stretchers. According to officials at Brampton uh, Civic uh, Speaker, the new Peel Memorial actually reduced patient volume for about 10 days. 10 days. But now the Civic Hospital is back to severe overcrowding that's putting patients in Brampton into Question. hallway medicine when they deserve so much better. When will this Liberal government stop the cuts to hospitals, admit that they've created a gridlock crisis, and do something Thank about you. it? Thank you, sir. Well, Mr. Speaker, the member opposite knows that the Peel region is one of the fastest growing parts uh, in this country, and that's why we're responding with the level of funding that we are, because the William Osler Health System that Brampton Civic is part of, we actually increased their funding uh, last year by 6.5 per cent, more than $30 million, Mr. Speaker, so that they would be able to address uh, the uh, increased capacity, the uh, volume issues that they're seeing. But I was very proud 
proud to be with the Premier a couple of weeks ago at Peel Memorial. I mean, the member opposite seems to discount the importance of that centre to the community population, but an incredible facility, the Peel Memorial Wellness Centre, which we opened just a couple of weeks ago, which is providing a whole myriad of services, cataract surgery, uh, emergency care, uh, all a whole set of comprehensive outpatient care. We know, talking directly with the patients, the clients and the yes, staff, sir. that that is making a tremendous difference uh, in the region, Mr. Speaker. A new question, the member from Barrie. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of International Trade. Yes. As the trade landscape around the world is in constant motion, it is important that Ontario continues to position itself in a way that leverages the strength of our growing sectors. The minister has long emphasized the importance of a diversification in both the markets that we trade and the sectors we promote within those markets. In the past year, Ontario has conducted a host of successful trade missions to countries like India, South Korea, and Japan, promoting sectors spanning from agri-food and financial tech to ICT and clean tech. Given the success of these missions, I was excited to hear that last week the minister held, led a mission to China, a priority market for Ontario's export. Oh. Can, this speaker please, speaker, can the minister please uh, tell about the important relationship that Ontario has with China and how businesses and workers stand to benefit from these relationship-building efforts? Thank you. Minister of International Trade. Thank you, thank you, Speaker, for the question, and I want to thank the Honourable Member from Barry for asking. Speaker, our future economic growth relies on our ability to compete globally, and that's a fact. That's right. China is Ontario's second largest trading partner. From 2012 to 2016, two-way trade between Ontario and China has increased by a whopping 35 per cent. The purpose of my latest mission to China was to support Ontario companies in signing new business ag agreements, strengthening trade and economic partnerships, and encouraging investment in Ontario. Speaker, expanding the reach of Ontario exporter by connecting them to foreign buyers allows for Ontario to make innovative goods yes, and services to get the exposure they deserve. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, as jurisdictions around the globe aggressively promote their economies on world business stage, it is reassuring to know that Ontario has taken the steps necessary to not only compete globally but lead the charge. It is encouraging to know that our government has made strides in making exporting easier for Ontario's up-and-coming businesses. As the minister has mentioned, the relationship between Ontario and China in regards to trade and investment is growing yearly. However, it is important to note that developing lasting global partnership is not something that can be done overnight. It requires regular and meaningful interaction over multiple meetings to develop the kinds of relationships that see significant uh, economic returns. Speaker, through you to the minister, can the minister speak to the inroads made by Ontario companies in Question. China? Thank you. Minister. Speaker, thank you for the opportunity again. Speaker. The member from Barrie is correct. We have made significant inroads in making exporting easier for everyday Ontarians. Last week, Speaker, in Guangzhou, a city in southern China, I witnessed the signing of an agreement between Ontario-based OTT Financial and Tencent's WeChat payment. The signing creates an immediate and instant connection between Canadian merchants and Chinese customers, bringing our jurisdictions closer through tourism and trade. As the mission moved to Shanghai and Jiangsu province, I had the privilege of speaking at the official launch of United Power, a company that uses Ontario technology to produce materials and parts Answer. for EV batteries. Speaker, seeing Ontario companies make connections and partnerships that will help them scale up and succeed in global market is a testament to this government's commitment to position Ontarians for the economy of the future. Thank you, Speaker. The question the member from Whitby, Oshawa. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Finance, who I also wrote to last week. Stop, stop. Member from Beaches East York, come to order.
Carry on. Thank you, Speaker. Due to this Liberal government's reckless financial policies, hardworking families in the region of Durham are struggling. Interest payments on the government's massive debt are crowding out funding for public services, particularly patient care at Lake Ridge Health and Ontario Shores Mental Health Centre. Speaker, local businesses are closing their doors due to the excessive hydro costs, as well as the government's cap and trade tax grab scheme. As well, Epsom Public School in Scugog and Torres Central Public School in Brock are being considered for closure to balance the government's budget. Speaker, when will this minister address Ontario's massive debt and stop balancing the budget on the backs of hard-working families in the region of Durham? Mr. Finance. I think this is the last question of the day on respect. Here's the, here's the gist of all of their letter campaigns in a nutshell. They're saying this, give me more money in my community, pay for my hospital, cut everywhere else, Mr. Speaker. That is not what we're doing. We represent all of Ontario on this side of the House. We're taking a balanced approach that ensures that every community benefits from the prosperity of our The member from Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke could actually get himself warned if he carries on like that again. If not named. Wrap up, please. I'll wait for the supplementary, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. We're from Thornhill. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Our Ontario school boards are forced to make unpopular decisions because they need every dollar they can find to fund special needs. In the suburbs north of Toronto, schools such as Our Lady of Peace and Maple are being shut down even though they are 90 per cent full. Stornoway Crescent Public School in Thornhill is being considered for closure, even though the community is shut off from all other schools by major thoroughfares. Mr. Speaker, four out of five school boards are spending more on special needs than they are getting. This is at the expense of other programming. Will yeah. the minister please tell us what his new budget will do to help our schools properly fund special need programming? Good question. Good question. Mr. So, Mr. Speaker, let's be clear. We're balancing the budget, and because we're balancing the budget, we're investing more. We're building more new schools, Mr. Speaker. We're investing more frontline. We're supporting more uh, individuals and people and students, especially those with disabilities and learning disabilities, Mr. Speaker. We've taken a leadership in this respect. And furthermore, Mr. Speaker, Speaker, we're, we are investing and supporting rural Ontario. We're providing predictable uh, funding throughout the past four years, more so than ever before. We recognize the importance of all of Ontario as we move forward, not just any one particular community. Thank you. Thank you. New question, the member from London, Fanshawe. Questions to the Acting Premier. The Association for Nonprofit and Service for Ontarios and the Ontario Community Supports Association have asked you to protect public health care. Instead, you drop the requirement that only not-for-profit organizations are eligible for provincial funding to provide community support services. Minister, you know that privatization costs more, has less oversight, and ultimately Ontario's families pay the price. The Wynn government didn't have a mandate to privatize Hydro Wynn, and the Wynn government doesn't have a mandate to privatize our public health care system either. Minister, Acting Premier of Ontario, will you protect Ontario seniors so they shouldn't have to empty their wallets to get the community supports they need? What will it take for the Wynn Liberals to stop public health care dollars from going to profit? Thank you. Deputy Premier. Uh, to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Care. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And we've been listening to our stakeholders uh, as we uh, move through the implementation of the Patients First Act, uh, and it's uh, critically important the advice that they provide, the experience that they give, 
So that's why today, in fact, Mr. Speaker, I wrote a letter to all limbs uh, across the province uh, asking them, th because we're not making any changes, we're actually maintaining the status quo, Mr. Speaker, and that was important to all parties. But in the interim, as we further consult with all stakeholders over the next several months, I've asked our LINs not to engage in any new contracts with new uh, community care providers, Mr. Speaker. So I've asked them, in fact, I've requested that they uh, implement a moratorium uh, so we can have this consultation and we'll have the consultation uh, with all our Remember stakeholders. Member from London Fanshawe, you asked conference. the question. Thank you. I beg. No, no, it, it's it's over. I beg to inform the House the following report was tabled. Report from the Ombudsman of Ontario concerning investigation of the Ministry of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Point of order, the government house leader. Thank you, Speaker. I believe uh, you will find that we have unanimous consent to uh, move a motion without notice regarding Yad Vasham. Government House Se Leader is seeking unanimous consent. Put forward a motion without notice. Do we agree? Agreed. Agreed. Government House Leader. Speaker, I move that following the routine proceeding member statement, statements today, Monday, April 24, 2017, up to five minutes be allotted to each caucus to speak to recognize Yad Vasham, at the end of which the member for Thornhill will recite a prayer in ancient Hebrew. Mr. Nakfi moves that the following are routine proceedings and member statements today, Monday, April the 24th, 2017, up to five minutes be allowed it for each caucus to speak to recognize Yad Vashem. At the end of the member from Thornhill, will recite an ancient, ancient he, uh, a prayer in ancient Hebrew. Do we agree? Agreed. Agreed. The Minister of Community Safety on a point of order. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I beg your forgiveness. On behalf of the uh, Ottawa Caucus, au nom du Ottawa Caucus, j'aimerais reconnaître la présence du like East Gallery of Michael Cochrane, uh, President and CEO of the Ottawa Tourism. Welcome, Michael. Bienvenue. Thank you. The member, the member from Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke, on a point of order. Yes, thank you, Speaker. Uh, I would like to. Uh, it's not a point of order, but I'd like to wish my granddaughter Lily Coburn a happy fifth Lord. birthday today. Thank you. It is not a point of order, but you better have done it. The Minister of Tourism, Culture, Sport, point of order. Thank you, Speaker. I'd like to welcome to Queen's Park today uh, members of the Tourism Industry Association of Ontario. In fact, 15 members in the House joining us today, Speaker, including Beth Potter, the CEO, Joanne Valange, the President and CEO of Tourism Toronto, and several board members. And I'd like to invite all members of the House to join us at a reception uh, this evening in rooms 228 230. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Speaker. Welcome. Springdale, point of order. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd also like to make an introduction. We have a group of grade 9 and 10 students here visiting us from India today. Vijay Singh Danda, Rushal Bansal, Parmur Singh Harpalpur, Prabhsimran Birdi, Moksha Gupta, Vijay Singh Sidhu, Deep Satra, and their coordinators, Rajesh Bhatia and Sangeetha Malik, as well as our local coordinator, president and CEO of CAI, CIAS, Mrs. Krishan Kandra, and also my good friend, Indrithan, who's here supporting her son today, who is a page. Thank you, Mr. <laughs> Yeah, Mr. Speaker, I'm totally against her wishes. So I'd like, on behalf of all members of the House, to wish uh, the member for Dufferin Caledon a happy birthday. And uh, I'm not sure what number it is, Mr. Speaker. That's a very. That's a, that, that's, that's a good wish and also a very smart move. Um, there are no deferred votes. This House stands recessed till 1 p.m. this afternoon.